please watch this video in full. Please. If you watch no other videos by me, please just watch this one and however many others come after it pertaining to what I'm talking about here. Only these ones, if nothing else. I'm not going to talk very long about all the details of these, just separately. I'm just going to give the quickest gist of what's been going on, and then get right into them. For the past two to two and a half months now, I've been working on writing out and just crafting theories and what I feel are needed implementations in four different scientific fields for the implementations. Theories are also mainly pertaining to those four fields of study, but there is some amounts of other things in there too. They're based off of my own observations and my own research, as well as other people's research and their experiences, specialists of different kinds within these fields, or people who are just, well, their own self-researchers into them, and have done commentary of some kind on them, spoken about their thoughts. They've been festering in my mind for the last few months, just the skeleton of them, but now the meat is here. I haven't got them all completely in terms of typing finished in the way I would have wanted to before I left the city of Ottawa, as well as right now having my own copy printed out, majority of them, but again they're not all finished, but oh well. However, I know the basic ideas of them, and I want to explain them here before I send them off to the people, at least as many as I can, of who I cite in this. Please just listen to them, think about them, critically think about them, don't just take what I say at face value, I want you to actually Think about what I'm saying here for yourself. Research into the different fields that I'm talking about in relation to these. And draw your own conclusions. And please share this video and again all the rest that come after pertaining to this with however many people you can. Because I feel that these theories are in some way of high importance. I know that's egotistical, but right now I don't care. So, let's begin. The five inherent human desires, psychobiology. For this one I've created my own little equation for. Meaning plus control plus understanding plus uniqueness plus familiarity equals willingness equals motivation or apathy. I submit the following conclusion, that human beings by our psychobiological nature subconsciously desire five things within our existence upon developing self-awareness of our intrinsic internal loneliness, consciously accepted or not. Those five things being meaningfulness slash purposefulness in our lives, control over the forces within our lives, understanding from other people and from ourselves as to why we function the way we function, having unique qualities to us that are solely our own, and having familiar qualities that are indicative of concepts slash constructs we've grown accustomed to. It is thereby because of these five inerrant desires that we gain a sense of subconscious willingness to obtain things that we think could fulfill them, which then I either leads to the conscious psychological response of motivation to push ourselves towards said things in our social settings that will satisfy this need, 
or counterintuitively, if we gain the motivation to obtain said things from subconscious willingness, then attempt to achieve goals that will bring them to us, and our willingness is not being met to our expectations for meaning, control, understanding, uniqueness, and familiarity, whether in major or minor ways, we develop the conscious psychological response of apathy, lack of motivation, dull sense of interest, or complete disinterest in daily activities, which then in turn can lead to heavy feelings of internal and social unfulfillment, along with the development of a variety of psychiatric disorders, mental personality or behavioral, as well as habitual dependencies in attempts to absolve feeling dissatisfied. The apathetic response in particular, from what I've observed, mainly manifests itself in subtle forms amongst most average people through emotional reactions such as verbal anger, agitation, anxiousness, uncertainty, doubtfulness, fearfulness, awkwardness, passivity, dismissal, sadness, boredom, procrastination, moderatum, disappointment, anhedonia, lack of joy or pleasure, alexithemia, emotional devoidness, and lethargy, lack of physical energy, in this regard often relating to psychomotor impairment. Often as a result of the development of a depressive disorder, internalized or not, a dissociative disorder, a paranoia disorder, internalized or not, an anxiety disorder, internalized or not, antisocial personality disorder, sociopathy slash psychopathy, egotistical personality disorder, egocentrism, narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, avoidant personality disorder, catatonic personality disorder, dependent personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, dismissive behavioral disorder, aggressive behavioral disorder, attention-seeking personality disorder, passive-aggressive personality disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, nymphomania slash hypersexuality, sexuality, sex addiction, bipolar disorder, and bipolar aggression, often after disrupt to willingness has occurred, whether these, whether these disorders have formed due to social environmental factors and or genetic predispositions caused by interpersonal and societal problems. Just the same, I also believe that the motivational response can in many cases lead to the development of psychological illness, such as many of the ones mentioned before, along with psychotic disorders, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, as well as PRO, an internalized form of OCD, independent personality disorder, attentive personality disorder, A-type personality disorder, obsessive personality disorder, Machiavellian personality disorder, domineering behavioral disorder, thrill-seeking behavioral, dis behavioral disorder, kleptomania, an eccentric behavioral disorder, and vice versa to those typically associated with apathy. Mental conditions that are not disorders in and of themselves, such as gender dysphoria, color dysphoria, body dysmorphia, schizophoria, an intellectual complex, most often in association with narcissism, a superiority complex, most often in association with egotism, narcissism, and sociopathic slash psychopathic characteristics, megalomania, grandiose complex slash god complex, often in association with psychosis, a savior complex, and a morality complex, often in association with narcissism and egotism, I believe can also develop as a result of the five subconscious desires not being fulfilled to the individual's expectations. As of current, I'm not sure as to whether these conditions are more likely to form from a reaction to the motivational response or the apathetic response along with that of an identity crisis, an existential crisis, a spiritual crisis, or a morality crisis. I consider these four conditions to be consequences of the apathetic response. And just to jump in here quickly, on the topic of Eric Erickson's uh, theory of teenagers inherently will go through an identity crisis, I dispute that. I believe that's a byproduct of the world we live in. I don't believe that's innate to human nature. And also, it's a byproduct of the apathetic response. I can prove this theory by examining the ontological essence of human beings' overall livelihoods and daily actions. But first, I'll define the words, the wording of the five inherent desires. 
to mitigate confusion. Definition of meaning. Intend to convey, indicate, or refer to a particular thing or notion. Specify. Be of some specific importance to someone, especially as a source of benefit or object of affection. Desire to this desire or disdain design or disdain for a particular purpose. Have a motive or excuse in explanation. Definition of control, the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events, the ability to man manage a machine, vehicle, or other moving object, the restriction of an activity, tendency, or phenomenon, the power to restrain something, especially one's own emotions or actions, determine the behavior or s supervise the running of, maintain influence or authority over. Definition of understanding, the ability to comprehend something, an individual's perception or judgment of a situation, perceive the intended meaning of words, a language, or a speaker, perceive the significance, explanation, or cause of something. Definition of unique, being the only one of its kind, unlike anything else, belonging or connected to one particular person, group, or place, particularly remarkable, special, or unusual. Definition of familiar. Well known, well known from a long or close association, often encountered or experienced. Common. One who is often seen and well known, especially an intimate associate, companion. In close relation to, intimate, a close friend or associate. Now I'll use the example of a painter making a landscape portrait to demonstrate how these five things connect to each other and are innate to us all. The painter wants to paint a landscape portrait because the painter wants to paint a landscape portrait because they feel it will express something deeply personal to their childhood experiences as they grew up in a very rural area, and that it's worth being depicted in an image and shown to the world. Meaning. The painter decides to sell their finished portrait to a freelance auction organization and use an app designed specifically for art trading to negotiate a price. Then come the day of the auction, sits in on the bidding to see if the organization is advertising it to their liking, and can directly try to intervene, if not, control. The painter feels that the portrait is worth being shown to the world because the landscape houses things that are very sacred to them as a person into the cultural identity slash traditions of the community they grew up in, and hope that people will either be able to in some way relate to it through their own childhood experiences, or that they'll gain a different perspective through it, into experiences other than their own understanding. The painter decides to use a wet-on-wet -wet painting technique, plus that of a mixture of oil paints that they've pre-made themselves because they feel it gives better consistency. And instead of molding the landscape and modeling the landscape in a traditional, in a completely realistic way, they decide to give the portrait a bit more of an abstract style so that viewers can interpret some of it in their own ways. Uniqueness. The painter wants to make this art project of a landscape into a painted portrait rather than take a photograph of a landscape or record a video of a landscape or construct a diorama of a landscape because for most of their artistic career they've been a painter. They've used brushes and canvases to portray locations, objects, people, or ideas they have learned about and associated with over the years. And the subject matter of the piece is related to things they've known since childhood. Familiarity. All these things together create a psychological sense of willingness in the painter's subconscious mind, which triggers a response and motivation in the painter's conscious mind to push them towards making achievements that will bring their ideal and result into fruition. What if the painter's subconscious willingness is met with many obstructions and overbearing obstacles, whether from external or internal forces? This can then trigger a response of apathy in the painter's conscious mind in the form of frustration, aggression, authoritativeness, sadness, anxiety, etc. And if these disruptions to the painter's willingness are constant it can induce a psychological disorder or multiple in them. I'll give a few more examples to further prove this theory. Someone is going to grab a spoon and a bowl to eat soup. Why are they bothering to try and feed themselves? Because this gives them a sense of purpose to get their 
physical body moving in order to satisfy their hunger and so they don't starve to death. Why are they using hand why are they using their hands to grab a spoon and bowl from the cupboard? Because this gives them a sense of control over their ability to manipulate their limbs so that the items are handled the way they like them to be. Why do they search around the cupboard if they can't immediately find the spoon and bowl? Because this gives them a sense of understanding that the item should be somewhere else instead of as to in, in somewhere else inside it, as that's why they as that's where they typically are. And if someone asks them why are they searching, they can then tell this reasoning to them, thus attempting the same thing. Why do they eat out of a bowl from side to side instead of a straight up and down motion, or put the spoonful of soup entirely in their mouth instead of slurping it? Because this gives them a sense of uniqueness in relation to their egotistical tendencies, as it's something that seemingly is their own personal way of eating the food. Why are they choosing to eat soup and use the spoon and bowl as utensils to eat it? Because this gives them a sense of familiarity as they've grown accustomed to these things over the years. Soup was a common dish in their household as a child, and spoons and bowls were commonly used to eat liquid-based meals. Here's another example. Someone is getting a friend to help them move pieces of furniture out of their current house to then be moved to where, the, to where their new house will be. Why are they bothering to move furniture out of the house? Because this gives them a sense of purpose to move to get their things ready to relocate to another to another living space. Why are they trying to move furniture themselves? Well, and they're why are they trying to move the furniture using themselves and their friend? Because this gives them a sense of control over their ability to maneuver the furniture with their own hands, plus that of being able to direct their friend as to how to lift or place it. Why are they choosing to move all the furniture outside instead of moving it one by one once they relocated to their new home? Because this gives them a sense of understanding as to having it all organized out, outside could help them better orient the pieces of furniture for picking, for packing in a more spacious area and can relay this to their friend if asked. Why are they going about moving the furniture using them and their friend and no one else? Because this gives them a sense of uniqueness as from their assessment of the situation, moving the furniture outside only required two people's strength. Why are they utilizing their friend's strength to move the furniture instead of just having them there for moral support? Because this gives them a sense of familiarity as getting other people to help with physical strenuous, physically strenuous tasks is something they've grown used to doing. Other. Someone phones their local emergency services number to try and get paramedics out to their location because a family member of theirs is having a severe epileptic episode. But the dispatcher isn't listening to them properly, being very dismissive and annoying. So this person then starts yelling at the dispatcher. Why are they trying to get medical help for their family member? Because this gives this because this gives them a sense of purpose. No, sorry, read that wrong. Because their sense of purpose has been disrupted as they've had to drop whatever they were previously doing to help their family member as they care about this person and want to make sure they're safe. Why are they yelling at the dispatcher? Because their sense of control over the situation has been disrupted as they're having to demand that the operator listen to what they're saying in the hopes that they'll start taking them seriously. Why are they frantically trying to explain what's going on to the dispatcher? Because their sense of understanding has been disrupted as they can't truly believe how an emergency service worker could be so inept and are trying to make them realize the urgency of the matter. Why do they continue to argue with the dispatcher over the issue? Because their sense of uniqueness has been was disrupted once the dispatcher began dismissing them. And they've been and as they were initially explaining their perception of what was happening as calmly as they thought possible. Why are they upset that the operator isn't listening to them? Because their sense of familiarity has been disrupted as they've been normalized to the idea that emergency service workers are supposed to be more empathetic, attentive, and professional. 
in scenarios like this. Last example. A baby is crying and screaming after their parents didn't feed them at the typical time of day they're used to eating at and, start, and staring at them whilst throwing a tantrum. Why is the baby upset? Because their sense of purpose has been disrupted as they want they wanted to obtain food to satisfy their hunger and so they would gain sustenance to survive. Why is the baby screaming whilst crying? Because this because their sense of control has been disrupted as from their perspective they feel that their underdeveloped form, forms of communication are what had are what had made their parents bring them food before. Why is the baby staring at their parents while screaming and crying? Because their sense of understanding has been disrupted as they don't know why their parents didn't bring them food at the usual time. Why is the baby using staring as a tactic to get their parents to come over and feed them? Because their sense of uniqueness has been disrupted in relation to their developing ego. As before, they had thought that their parents would automatically cater to their needs on cue. Why is the baby desperately looking at their parents to bring them the food they need? Because their sense of familiar familiarity has been disrupted, as all they've known up until this point is their parents bringing them something to eat when they're hungry. I draw influence for this hypothesis from Dr. Carl Jung, a Swiss psychiatrist, psych psychoanalyst, neuropsychologist, and philosopher, and his theories of the ego and the unconscious mind and the collective unconscious. Dr. Edward B. Bynum, an American clinical psychologist slash psychosocioanalyst, and his theory of the African unconscious, the psychological theory of conscious aggression being a reaction to subconscious fear of the unknown, and an experimental study the studies thesis by Duncan A. Chambers, a psychology student who attended University of Montana in Missoula, USA in 1986, titled Anger as a Defense Against Fear, Dr. Leonard Berkowitz, an American clinical psychologist and philopsychologist, and his additions to the theory of frustration anger principle, Dr. Shalom H. Schwartz, a Canadian cultural psychologist, psychosociologist, slash Jewish rabbi, and his theory of basic human values, Dr. Viktor Frankl, an Austrian neurologist, psychiatrist, and philosopher, and his theory of a will to meaning and clinical practice of logotherapy, Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philosopher, poet, composer, sociologist, philologist, genealogist, and his philosophical belief of affirming the unconditional embrace of life, often referred to as Nietzsche's cure for nihilism, Felix Skura, an American YouTuber slash commentator, and his contributions to the philosophies of egoism and optimistic nihilism, and his theory of human beings innately having unconscious biases geared towards their own idealistic livelihoods, Professor Uri Alon, an Israeli systems biologist and teacher and biology teacher, and his contributions to the studies of relational emotional subjectivism and his diagram model for the phenomenon in the scientific community known as the cloud. Shi Heng Yi, a German Sholin monk slash martial artist slash philosopher, has contributions to the religions of Chan Buddhism and Taoism and the philosophy of Stoicism through Sholin Kung Fu practices. Dr. Karen Horne, a German psychoanalyst and psychosociologist, and her theory of neurotic needs and my own personal observations. To reiterate, human animal functions on the basis of five inherent desires, meaning, control, plus control, plus understanding, plus uniqueness, plus familiarity, the subconscious. This then equals a sense of willingness to obtain things that we believe could fulfill these desires, the subconscious, which then triggers the emotional response of motivation, the conscious. And if the five desires are not being fulfilled by the things we try to obtain, this triggers the emotional response of apathy, the conscious. To further prove this theory, I'm going to attempt to tie all my other proposed hypotheses back into the five inherent human desires in some way. As of current, I wholeheartedly believe this theory. Now, as for tying all the rest in, I somewhat do that, and I'll explain more in the ones that I didn't fully get typed out, but I'm going to, don't worry. For this one, and for a few others, I create a diagram. 
pulled an all-nighter for this and stayed up later into the next day for it. So, just please review it. I'll give you a minute to I'll give you a minute to pause the video and just look over this before I explain it. Let's hope these are good enough angles I'm getting. I'm turning it correctly. So, <sighs> this entire area here is the unconscious mind, the psychological state, the subconscious. So, at the core here, we have are five inherent human desires. Meaning, control, understanding, uniqueness, and familiarity. Which, because of these, in our emotional state, once these have formed to some degree, this then in the subconscious leads to a sense of willingness. Which is what gives us our want to obtain fulfillment, propels us, towards actually seeking out things in our lives, no matter what they may be, that could potentially, from our own biases and our own perspectives, what we assume or think will bring fulfillment, what could fulfill these subconscious desires. So then this leads to, in the conscious, our conscious response and our conscious minds, the emotional response of motivation, the want and drive to actually obtain and propel ourselves towards gaining said things, which can go which can go one of two ways. It can either go to, actually, technically, three ways. It could go one of three ways. It could go completely smoothly, lead to your fulfillment, which, following this line down here, will mutually gratify gratification, the subconscious, both five desires and the willingness, and our conscious response and motivation, it'll mutually gratify all of them. It could lead to it. What I've observed is that overfixation in relation to disorders, that, that's probably a better way to hold it. In relation to disorders that can form from the motivation, Overfixation on attempting to achieve, well, the things that we think will fulfill our wants can lead to motivational psychological disorders and conditions, which can be as the ones I explained, and it can be vice versa with the apathetic ones. So basically, both the motivation and the apathetic responses can cause the same psychological disorders to some degree or another. Or, when met with... When met with conflict, external, which then leads to internal conflict, this then leads to a disruption to, well, your motivation, and leads to the conscious 
in the conscious mind or the emotional state, apathy, which as I explained, presents in a variety of ways. And don't mind these here just yet. I'll explain those after this in their entirety, in their entirety, which then leads to a, well, a relay, as you're seeing here, to what I'm calling biologic thanatophobia. Now that's in the subconscious, in the unconscious mind, which for general apathy, I probably should have just written relate to thanatoph three relate to apathy, but whatever. In the cause of general apathy, such as general anxiousness, doubtfulness, uncertainty, uh, being unconfident in oneself, uh, fearfulness, uh, anger, aggression, verbal aggression, ir irritability, irritability and all that. General, this biologic thanatophobia acts as a protection mechanism which then causes the sense of general apathy but just the th same if there is a repeated repeated disruption to well our motivational response and causes constant increase in the apathetic response, this then leads to your thanatophobic protection. This will lead to apathetic psychological disorders and conditions forming. And here in this, well, checkered triangle of sorts is what I consider to be the process of suicidality in the mental disorder of depression and all its forms. But I'll explain that in a bit. That's the most severe disruption to biologic thanatophobia. And if you look at this circle here, you can see at the top, it says pro-socialization. And that is our human innate nature towards being pro-social. We know that antisocial traits and full-blown, well, disorders are exactly that, disorders. It's not in our nature to be loners, basically. But because of the psychological disorders, this then leads to, on both ends, disruption to socialization from both ends. Disrupt to our disrupt to our engagements with other human beings, with our own species, as well as can be towards other animal species. Disrupt to just socialization in general of any kind. Unhealthy and abnormal social presentations amongst the human race. And down here, as you can see, from this interactive loneliness, which is also a part of the subconscious mind, this is what I'm calling loneliness projection. And I'll get back to this because it plays a key role in the pro-social element here. So this is what I consider to be the psychological system of the five inherent human desires. I'll again leave that up for you to come on. Leave it up for you to pause and review at your leisure. And I'll explain it again to some extent in a minute for other theories. Interactive loneliness, psychobiology. 
I submit the following conclusion, that human beings by our psychobiological nature subconsciously are drawn towards both physical and metaphysical social engagements with other members of our own species and even different species within the animal kingdom upon gaining self-awareness of our intrinsic internal loneliness, consciously accepted or not, as an attempt by the emotional state to cope with said innate solitude, or potentially to even absolve the solitude, potentially even as an attempt at absolvement, most commonly expressed by individuals through means of interactions between one or more people, non-human animals, vocalized self-communication, talking to oneself, and usage of constructs and inventions created by humanity for a sense of familiarity, either by their initiation or continued participation in the activities being carried out. However, this is also expressed, though not as readily as the former overall, through means of interactions with living organisms other than humans, or typically found in non-human life forms and inanimate objects. Therefore, in accordance with this notion, it is not simply certain specified activities between human beings that are used to grapple with and or displace internal loneliness, such as drug and alcohol, substance use or abuse, romantic and or sexual intimacy slash gratification, sexual, oh, just said that, entertainment escapism or addiction, binge eating or binge drinking, purposeful pursuits at garnering social fame interpersonally or on a grand scale externally, career related distractions, etc. But rather all, all forms of human interaction of any kind as dictated by an individual's unconscious which can result in the development of a variety of psychiatric disorders and conditions such as depressive disorders, infatuation disorders, internalized or not, psychotic disorders, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, paranoia disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, histrionic personality disorder, attention seeking personality disorder, egotistic personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, dependent, borderline, attentive personality disorder, A-type, Schizotypical personality disorder, obsessive personality disorder, Machiavellian, psychopathy, sociopathy, domineering behavioral disorder, aggressive behavioral disorder, ADHD, eccentric behavioral disorder, voyeuristic behavioral disorder, nymphomania slash hypersexuality, sex addiction, bipolar, bipolar aggression, anorexia, bulimia, restrictive food intake disorder, gender dysphoria, color color dysphoria, body dysmorphia, intellectual complexes, savior complex, an identity crisis, an existential crisis, and a spiritual crisis. The psychobiologic feature, I feel, is also to blame for development of the currently classified rare mental disorders of erotomania and factitious disorder and behavioral disorder, eating disorder, of rumination disorder. As far as I've observed, this subconscious coping mechanism for our innate loneliness is not just, for our internal loneliness, is not just innate within human evolutionary emotional biology, but is quite literally the sole definitive reason for us by historically documented nature with millennia of evidence being pro-social creatures. As in parallel with my proposed theory of the five inherent human desires and biologic thanatophobia in relation to all three elements coexisting within the psychological state, it is the only component, at least as far as I can detect, that is in essence a driving force towards participative social socialization with those of our own species, whereas Whereas every other component, whether it be subconscious or conscious, is ontologically designed for the purpose of selfish gratification to preserve our want for meaning to the lives we lead for a mere point to striving to maintain our life force control over factors that could potentially determine the outcome of our lives, understanding from others and from our, ourselves as to why exactly we act and feel the way we do, uniqueness in what we attribute to our self-identities and sense of self-importance, our egos, and familiarity in the physical and metaphysical environments we surround ourselves with. So, taking a look here, 
I genuinely feel that interactive loneliness, what I'm calling the subconscious interactive loneliness, is the only thing that makes our nature pro-social instead of anti-social. I feel that this innate psycho, this innate subconscious feature is predominantly more noticeable when there is only a one-on-one, -on -one, uninterrupted, and mainly isolated conversation between two individuals who are both displaying very similar emotional reactions to a, dis to a discussed topic, often presenting said reciprocation of emotions and perspective through some amount of mimicking towards the other person's demeanor and personification, whether their shared interaction is Exonerating happiness, enthusiasm, calmness, sadness, somberness, disappointment, discontentment, aggression, frustration, anxiousness, fearfulness, etc. With each party being highly immersed within the engagement, which in many instances culminates in, culminates in much sharing of personal vulnerability overall. This entire process of a conscious outwardly and invoked interaction by humans is a subconscious attempt to provide solace and comfort to the internal dissolution to the internal dissolution and unbreachable metaphysical barriers of our cognitive thought process I refer to as loneliness projection as is very much so at least from my perspective an expression of tangible but sadly indescribable extensive indescribable extensive emptiness of the enclo of the enclosed consciousness an emptiness so unnerving to the psyche that it instinctually actively tries to induce mitigation or potentially extermination of the devoid sensation to a maximal extent with that extent being achieved by further utilizing slash instigating our five inherent subconscious desires to garner fulfillment in our pro-socialization for others to hopefully, however ultimately, satisfactorily unattainable by our psychobiology, appease the uncomfortability. Now, though I believe this natural psycho psychological property is explainable through this lens of examination, as to where that aforementioned uncomfortable disposition to garner to gain self-awareness of our intrinsic solitude actually originates from and why it even develops in the first place currently is beyond my knowledge i do not have a single clue as to any possible reason for why we psychobiologically become unconsciously disturbed by this realization and to make no claim to have one i can prove this theory by pointing directly to thousands of years of human evolution and formations of various civilizations, as well as numerous publicly visible accounts of human beings, even in their most antisocial actions in correlation with disorder, how we basically act in daily lives. So, let's put that over there. So, This here interactive loneliness. Basically, in some form, it's well, similar enough, I guess, in the way I've drawn it to thanatophobia here. It's like a shield, I guess, or it's, well, it's a gained uncomfortability that upon the awareness to our cognitive internal loneliness. Once it's gained by us in major or subtle ways that we may not be fully aware of, we realize it subconsciously, but we're not aware of it. Or we're not, well, technically are aware of it. We don't accept it. I don't have a good word for it. It acts as a driving force to us being collectively proactive with other people. Why, when we feel incredibly sad and alone 
in many instances, we will go towards people. We will go towards others or things that other people have created in some way. Because our subconscious tries to basically, well, I'm calling it loneliness projection here. It's what connects to the collective pro-socialization of all of humanity. It's basically the subconscious trying to throw out, I guess I'll say, the, the innate loneliness. It's like trying to, I only use the word cope because I want, I would like to make a distinction between conscious attempts at absolvement to loneliness and technically coping as well, usually from, well, from trauma to some degree. It is from trauma to absolve loneliness consciously, anything that you're using to try and absolve it. And this subconscious mechanism of, again, I'm calling it coping just to differentiate the two, but if we're being actually completely honest, it could be just a complete attempt to absolve from subconscious psychological state. So yeah, that I believe that all by this theory that every single interaction you ever have, anyone ever has with someone else or inventions and things created by other human beings that you've become familiarized to with your sense of familiarity is an attempt to gratify the loneliness, to cope with it to some degree, all of it. It's not just certain activities and you will never be, by this notion, you will never be subconsciously comfortable with being alone. Consciously, I feel you can be, yes, comfortable with being on your own. But subconsciously, you never will be. Because it is a part of our nature for pro-socialization, as far as I'm concerned. Many acts of purposely trying to distance yourself from people and, well, trying to consciously be lonely are psychological disorders as a response to the apathetic, well, response and deflection from biologic thanatophobia. Speaking of which, biologic thanatophobia, psychobiology. I submit the following conclusion that human beings by our psychobiological nature subconsciously have an inherently embedded sense of thanatophobia, fear of death, or the dying process, and is a crucial element to the conscious to the continuous conscious pursuit of maintaining factors within our livelihoods that will seemingly, based upon individual perceptions and cognitive biases, keep ourselves alive and functional to a high degree of physical and emotional sustainability. Most typically sorry. Most typically utilizing methods that have been constantly present throughout the duration of our separate lifespans up until to up until a specified point in time. This innate subconscious phobia towards death from my observations has evolved inst instinctually within us within us as a primary response in the protection of our five inherent subconscious desires for meaning, control, understanding, uniqueness, and familiarity solely manifesting itself in correlation with the conscious apathetic response and can lead to the development of a variety of psychiatric disorders, depressive disorders, dissociative disorders, paranoia disorders, anxiety disorders, psychotic disorders, schizophrenia, schizoaffective, schizoactive disorder, obsessive compulsive, histrionic, antisocial personality disorder, sociopathy, egocentrism, narcissistic personality disorder, borderline, Avoidant personality disorder, catatonic personality disorder, dependent personality disorder, independent personality disorder, attentive, A-type, obsessive, personality disorder, Machiavellian, Machiavellian, schizoid, schizotypical, attention-seeking, passive-aggressive personality disorder, dismissive behavioral, aggressive behavioral disorder, ADHD, nymphomania, slash hypersexuality, bipolar disorder, bipolar aggression, kleptom 
and kleptomania, along with mental the mental along with mental conditions that aren't disorders in and of themselves, such as an identity crisis, an existential crisis, a spiritual crisis, and a morality crisis. To broaden the definition, thanatophobia is, by current, by current psychology and terminology, regarded as an intensive pathological and irrational petrification of one's own self dying, people around one's self dying, whether they have close interpersonal connections to them or not, or even the idea and aesthetic of death itself. The fear is considered a mental disorder, more specifically an anxiety disorder, and often attributed to such diagnosed on the basis of past traumatic events relating to someone within close proximity to a patient who tragically passed away, and cognitive behavioral therapy is typically prescribed for treatment. If it wasn't obvious by my central narrative with this hypothesis, I completely reject this notion. At the very least, on the clinical idea that it's a psychological disorder. Are there individuals who consciously, consciously, unhealthily, who are consciously unhealthily petrified by theirs and others' potential demise? Yes, absolutely. That's part, that's, that part of the criteria I feel is correct in its analysis of an abnormal human mentality. However, I make an emphasis on the concept of this petrification being within the conscious mind, as I do believe there needs to be a distinction between further gained mortification within human beings' readily available consciousness and what I've determined to be the subconscious protection mechanism of biologic thanatophobia. As far as I'm concerned, this emotion, emotional defense barrier is what essentially keeps our five unconscious desires shielded from disruptive external slash internal conflict serving as a disruption relay intaker as of sorts and specifically for our conscious response of apathy to to generate whether to generate what is perceived by different individual psychological states by based on cognitive biases to generate an appropriate emotional reaction to conflicting stimuli only having direct connections to the apathetic function, as in accordance with the five subconscious desires, said stimuli are unconsciously perceived as being a threat to our subconscious sense of willingness, originating from the five desires and our conscious response and motivation. So, to elaborate on that. We inherently fear death, as far as I'm concerned. It's not a conscious, readily aware psychological element. It is part of the unconscious. It is something that we have without deeply thinking about it, just like the five inherent human desires and interactive loneliness. It is here in the, if it'll focus here in the, and my fingers will stop shaking, here in the core element of the subconscious, it works as the primary protector or protect protection mechanism uh, to the subconscious desires and the willingness. It's so the conscious apathetic response basically acts as a relay system to it to deflect off, basically deflect off the sensation and protect our will to life, basically. But in the event of constant recurring disruption to the biologic thanatophobia, this will lead to apathetic psychological disorders and conditions because of, well, protection me mechanism, which leads to the disruption to pro-socialization as a whole. But interestingly enough here as well, if to a severe extent, specifically in relation to depressive, if I can ever hold this, depressive disorders, this triangle here, which represents suicidality, it is the most, well, they're all severe, but I consider to be the most severe disruption to thanatophobia, as this, well, integrates a desire to kill oneself, to commit suicide, which is abnormal, as this is part of our human function. 
So basically, on this basis, well, I guess I can further explain this. Because of this subconscious thanatophobia, this thanatophobic sense, as far as I'm concerned, in relation to the apathetic response, it generates the emotional reactions of sadness, of anger, of fear, of conscious fear of something, of disappointment. It, it, it generates all the same, absolutely all the same, what I just said, the reactions to apathy. It generates all the same because it's what controls it. It's what it acts as a relay system to it in our cycle in our emotional state. And because of thanatophobia, I genuinely believe that without that subconscious fear, we would not gain once disrupt has happened to our motivation and caused the apathetic response we would not gain the mental disorder of depression if we didn't have that specifically in relation to depression as well as well by this notion variety of other all other psychological disorders in relation to apathy we wouldn't gain them but especially in relation to depressive symptoms of lack of joy lack of happiness lack of uh well enthusiasm towards things we wouldn't gain that and especially in relation to sadness we would not become gloomy and dreary we would not become frustrated we if we didn't have that biologic thanatophobia as a protection mechanism to our five inherent desire desires and the willingness we would just, and we were met with conflict and disruption to our motivational response in the conscious mind. We would just, as far as I'm concerned, from what I've observed, once we hit the apathy, we would logically conclude that, oh, okay, that didn't work. And I know I'm not, I'm doing it right now, but it's not as simple as that on a metaphysical basis. We would not um, feel any sort of, any, even in the slightest, disappointment or discomfort to the fact that we reached the apathetic response. And if we had repeated encounters with the apathetic response, repeated disruption to the motivation, we would just logically conclude to basically commit suicide. We would not have any sort of protection mechanism. We wouldn't become depressed in any form, we wouldn't become consciously anxious or fearful. We wouldn't even have, as far as I'm concerned, the shriveless bit of cognitive doubt in our actions to commit suicide. If we didn't have that thanatophobic protection, we'd basically just logically conclude, oh, well, none of this works and nothing's actually fulfilling my life. Okay, I'm going to jump off a bridge. And without without the slightest possible doubt or feeling of uncertainty is this right to do do i really want to do this we wouldn't we would just logically conclude that but because we have this thanatophobia this fear of death subconsciously embedded to us it is basically what once we're met with apathy it's the only reason that we don't completely give up the second we're met with apathy in the slightest amount, in the slightest dissatisfaction or unexpected disruption in the smallest amount to even if you so much as accidentally drop the pen when you want to hold the pen for a long period of time or a desired period of time. If you accidentally dropped it, it's the only reason that we don't immediately give up when met with apathy. Because, well, it, it's because of the willingness and our five subconscious desires, it just protects 
our want to get out of bed in the morning. It's the only reason that we feed ourselves, that we get up, that we put ourselves into socializing scenarios, or in some form go towards um, familiar sites to us. As far as I'm concerned, it's the only reason. And it's a inherent protection mechanism for human, from human evolution. So there's that. There's no diagram for this one. Subconscious optimism, philo psychology. Note, disclaimer here. I do not regard this psychological phenomenon as psychobiologic because I do not believe that it is inherent within human nature, but instead a byproduct of interpersonal and societal influences. As far as I've observed, there are people in the world who do genuinely adhere to the philosophies of pessimism, cynicism, and misanthropy. And even if not subconsciously, this phenomenon has varying effects from person to person, and I do not want to generalize based solely on philosophical identity. I also do not, want, do not want to discredit individuals who have used analytical slash critical thought to form their own viewpoints. I submit the following conclusion, that a large portion of the human population who self-identify philosophically as being pessimists, cynics, and misanthropists are in actuality subconsciously optimists who are consciously drawn towards the aforementioned belief systems due to psychological trauma as a result of interpersonal and sociological situations in which in turn can also lead to, be linked to the development of a variety of psych psychiatric disorders, including depressive disorders, dissociative disorders, psychotic disorders, paranoia disorders, anxiety disorders, schizoaffective disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, A-type, sociopathy, antisocial, egotistical, borderline, histrionic, schizoid, avoidant, independent, catatonic, Passive aggressive, bipolar disorder, submissive behavioral, aggressive behavioral, and many more as well, probably. Whether these disorders have formed due to social and environmental factors and or genetic predispositions caused by interpersonal and societal problems. Before I go into demonstrating how the presence of subconscious optimism typically seems to manifest itself amongst most average people predominantly, Within these three belief communities, I'll define the philosophy stated and the usage of the specific psychological terminology as to deter any potential confusion on the matter. Definition of optimism. The philosophic principle of having hopefulness and confidence about the future or the successful outcome of something. The doctrine, especially as set forth by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, a German mathematician, philosopher, and politician, that this world is the best of all possible worlds, except ex expect things to turn out well, believing in the believing in the skill and ability to make good things happen. Definition of pessimism: the philosophic principle of seeing the worst aspect of things or believing that the worst will happen, a lack of hope or confidence in the future, a belief, especially as set forth by Arthur Schopenhauer, a German philosopher that this world is as bad as it could be and that stagnation will ultimately prevail over change one who is often seen as lacking hope or joy and is marked by disbelief or distrust believing that bad events will last a long time or forever definition of cynicism the philosophic principle set forth by diogenes the greek philosopher of having a sincere disbelief in sincerity or integrity assigning negative assumptions to social behaviors, cultural traditions, or systems of power, criticizing a set structural system whilst simultaneously operating within said system and attempting to have little influence over it, and ad an attitude characterized by a general distrust of the motives of others. Definition, definition of misanthropy. Philosoph yes. The philosophic principle of having a disdain slash dislike of humankind, of the belief that humanity is by nature destructive, chaotic, or malicious, a general hatred, distrust, or contempt of the human race, beha human behavior, or human nature, the fact or quality of not liking people as a whole. 
definition of subconscious, the psychological properties of or concerning the part of the mind of which one is not fully aware, but which influences one's actions and feelings, the part of your mind that that notices and remembers information when you are not actively trying to do so, and influences your behavior even though you do not realize it, existing in the mind but not immediately available to consciousness, otherwise referred to as the unconscious mind. In most cases, I would say that an individual becoming subconsciously optimistic usually occurs after an initially hopeful or overwhelmingly positive mentality towards their environmental surroundings and or interpersonal relationships with other people, whether through close family connections, friendships, culture, community, or merely by association, often during mid to late childhood. At this time, the individual's world perception will also have most likely been re reinforced in some form by their adult caregivers against their own true beliefs through the use of false personification, as is traditional in different parental methods across many societies, which then leads to further internalization of positivity and affirmation and affirming the individual's more true viewpoints. This reaction cycle seem, seems to typically continue until readily available alternative opinions of the world and humanity become a constant reoccurrence, sometimes from their own parental figures through and dropping of the false personas, often due to the child simply aging, as well as the individual having gained accessibility to new information that they haven't been previously exposed to. All these factors e eventually culminated eventually culminated in enough dis disturbances to the original condition of their emotional state to where noticeable cognitive alterations happened, which could be considered as psychological traumatization, thus having led to a conscious change in their own personal philosophical and moralistic beliefs. Now gravitating towards more pessimistic, cynical, or misanth misanthropic outlooks on human existentialism. From what I've observed, this shifting in perspective usually occurs during early to mid-teenhood and is further amplified from physical interactions with, with and observations of problematic aspects, or at the very least, what they consider to be problematic, of different social demographics, which then only develops more conscious biases towards counter-ideals within the individual and causes an attempt of newly and it causes an attachment to their newly recognized philosophies to form to their self-identity. As far as I'm concerned, this can happen whether or not the individual is actively aware of the proper terminology or ethical principles of said philosophies. However, I make an emphasis on the concept of conscious perception changes as, as the key feature of this philopsychological phenomenon because as stated before this development process, as stated before, this development process is what I feel often results in the subconscious integration of an optimistic belief system that the individual wants consciously outright held. As in some form, they still have a desire from for that worldview, that in fact by the reality that to be in fact the reality of the current situations in their life. Because it was a normalized concept that was perpetuated throughout their childhood and represented a sense of hopefulness, security, compassion from socialization, extreme idealism towards human nature, etc., whether those expectations were realistic or not, and has become cognitively suppressed over long periods of temperament from constant op opposite encounters. I can prove this theory by simply analyzing particular behavioral patterns exhibited by certain amounts of people who identify as pessimist, cynic, pessimist cynics, and misanthropists when it comes to social in interactions with others, most notably when in conversation or engaging in a debate slash argument with someone. In many cases, those who are subconsciously optimists, what's, what seems to be continuous in their socialization with people is that of sharing their conscious philosophical thoughts when asked or through their own willing interjections in conversation instead of what would be expected in alignment with the principles of their philosophies. For them to either brush for them to either brush off others' questions entirely or to not respond at all and merely remain silent. Instead of participating 
Instead of practicing these two options, they choose to actively share their viewpoints and values with the inquiring party, as if out of some sense of hope that they'll reciprocate their opinions and will understand their position on what they see as the unchanging nature of life in general, the benefits of mocking systems whilst using them in to their own advantage to their own advantage, or the detrimental existence of human beings in their totality. In layman's terms, they decide to talk with another person or persons about their beliefs of there being no real hope for things to get better, how societal systems we've created are mostly terrible, but don't make any effort to try and help fix them and just go with whatever opportunities come their way, or that humans are really bad creatures by default and can't possibly function well together but yet they keep on talking to the other person or persons as if hoping that they'll change their minds and agree with their stance, even though by their logic, none of what they're saying will make any sort of difference because people don't change and the social and the social systems that we have are awful and won't change. And by nature, they're horrible anyways. I'll give one specific example for each of the three predominantly corresponding philosophical demographics in regards to subconscious optimism. From my own personal accounts as to what I've typically observed from interacting with and researching people who consciously affiliate themselves with these identities. Someone is working with a coworker who someone is working with a coworker of theirs restocking storage shelves in their employees only area of the business they work for in Yellowknife, Canada. And whilst doing so, they start talking to their colleague about difficulties they're, they've been having trying to obtain permanent residency certification for living in Northwest Territories from, territor from the territorial government. Having to deal with constant backlogs, delays, appointment cancellations, two times from immigration officials and once from themselves because of personal matters, as well as like, having to deal with racial profiling slash prejudice from the immigration system. The two then get into a discussion about sociopolitical problems, problems that them and other people in their immediate lives have faced and share their perspectives on the issues. The worker going through the immigration process identifies himself as being a democratic anarchist, following more principles of egoism, with heavy beliefs of optimistic idealism towards what they feel human social co cooperation could potentially be, having a, having a lot of hopefulness that things have the ability to turn out better that than they currently are and always trying to see the goodness the more beneficial aspects in people the other worker identifies himself as being a social pessimist also following more principles of egoism but primarily disagrees with their colleague on the matter holding heavy beliefs of capitalistic pragmatism towards how human humans function within the current set societal structures of canada and other countries having a lot of unenthusiastic feelings for any attempts to change governmental, economic, cultural, geographical, or environmental policies, and mostly thinking that people individually don't change much in general, whether for better or for worse. The two have a peaceful back and forth debate for the rest of the duration of their shift and eventually come to, and eventually, never mind, and eventually come to the conclusion to agree to disagree on the topic. However, as far as this theory is concerned, the ontologic nature of this engagement on the part of the socially pessimistic co-worker is evidence for them actually subconsciously being optimistic. Because when looking at what the person is doing, they're in essence trying to make the other party understand their viewpoints by form of communication and attempting to provide justification slash proof, at least what they see as proof, for their philosophical beliefs and morality as if they they have a sense that the other party will become convinced of what they're saying about the issue and either gradually or immediately go through a philosophical perception shift in their own cognitive thought process, then coming to more pessimistic and pragmatic conclusions themselves, completely contrary to the social pessimist's ideals, because if they're, they genuinely felt that people and human social environments overall won't see any hopeful progression then them, and them con conversing with their colleague is futile. To put it simply, if you look at the pessimistic coworkers end of the conversa conversation, specifically at the fact that they're even bothering to express their feelings of hopefulness for true change for the idealistic coworker, and that people should just go with what's given 
what's given, it should be clear that this is absolutely contradicting and backwards to their own beliefs. Because by their logic, the co-worker who is an idealist won't change their opinions on the matter and will keep believing what, they're all, what they already believe because things and people can't possibly change. And yet they're still choosing to talk to them about how they feel and if it's going as if it's going to make any sort of difference, as if sharing their philosophies and morals and own experiences with situations in their life not changing, for better or worse, will make the other co-workers see their point of view and change their mind. So if the conscious pessimist was actually also subconscious, was actually also a subconscious pessimist, then why are they still talking to their colleague? What they're doing is entirely pointless and not worthwhile. Another example, someone is going to be hosting an indie comedy club event at a local conference hall in their hometown with a few comedians from the area. With the event being, sch being scheduled to happen on July 6th, starting at about 7 o'clock a.m. and finishing at 11 o'clock a.m., having their performance go on first and last till around 7 colon 50 a.m. The person hosting the comedy show identifies himself as being a more moderate leftist cynic and quite introverted personality-wise holding heavy beliefs of absurdism towards humans function amongst one another and distrustfulness in others sincerity when interacting with them basing much of their comedic style upon those social concepts plus incorporating rather underwhelming or downright miserable life experiences they've had mainly attempting to stay away from confrontation with set societal systems or problems that arise interpersonally for them they've been making preparations for the show in the weeks leading up to it until they get a phone call on July 3rd that the organizers are having are having issues with arranging supervisors for certain production regulations and are going to have to postpone the event until July 11th which it'll then instead be starting at 3 colon 30 p.m. and ending at 7 colon 25 p.m. this utterly infuriates them as their two children both have extracurricular sc school sport tournaments on that day one, one's lasting from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m., and the other is lasting from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. And they're not going to miss those events because them and their family members have been looking forward to participating in it for months. So they attempt calling the organizers of the comedy club event to try convincing them to push, to push its scheduling back another day to July 12th so that they'd be... They, they, uh, so that they'd be available for hosting the show as they very much desire to do. They're able to get in touch with the organizers and explain their situation, but unfortunately those in charge are unable to postpone the event again as the only people legally capable of production supervision, supervision of the supervision are available for just one day out of the entire month of July, the 11th, with the conference hall being completely booked for usage all throughout the rest of summer and autumn. The comedian keeps desperately trying to persuade the organizers to reschedule the show for the next day, saying that they themselves will work as pr a production supervisor, whether or not they're legally certified to. But those in charge once again decline and state that they're incapable of it, that if they're incapable of attending on the new date, they'll sadly have to find a different person to host, which the comedy club runners make clear they didn't want because they believe they believe the would-be hosting comedian and style is hilarious as they've seen them perform at other venues and originally asked them to do so thinking they they perfectly fit the position. This greatly agitates them, but they feel a sense of genuineness in the organizer's calmness, uh, organizer's claims, and quickly come comes to understand their dilemma and doesn't continue protesting in protesting, instead choosing to go about their typical daily activities. But again, examining this example by its ontological nature on the part of the cynical comedian gives leeway to proof of them being subconsciously optimistic. By the very fact that they're choosing to actively engage in confrontational discourse with the comedy events organizers, who are in every possible context, at least as far as, as I regard, a systematic or at the lowest level systemic social force formulated to help bring the show into fruition, an organized group of people that have high-ranking authority over the assembly, maneuvering, advertising, financing, and material resource distribution of 
the said event, which the cynical comedian is attempting to go against. Even more so with the addition of them willingly offering up their services for supervisory duties illegally, not having any governmental authorization slash regulated certification to do so under the dictation of the law for their administrative district and or nation. In essence, making an attempt to combat the already established government system that they supposedly are merely passive and complacent towards, plus that of them actually believing the praise that the organizers are giving them for their entertainment work, feeling that it's sincere and truthful, all of which in principle completely contradicts their own set of values. To put it simply, if you look at the cynical comedian's end of the problem, specifically the fact that they're bothering to try and fight back at the organizers' decisions to delay the show by one day, which wasn't in alignment with their own schedule, or that they actually accept what the organizers are saying about their work as being very genuine, it should be clear that this is totally hypocritical to what they claim is their belief system. Because by their logic, them pushing against the forces of power won't change anything for their situation or make any difference whatsoever, as all human societal structures are just entirely incurable diseases and people by nature are mostly insincere. And when it comes to helping or caring for others to, grat to gratify their own selfishness when yet they're still choosing to strike up an argument with those in charge to get what they want to happen happening, trying very hard to get them to realize their predicament and operate around their needs. Then when that doesn't, when, then when that doesn't happen, taking the organizer's apologies and going on with the rest of their day. So if the conscious cynic was actually also a subconscious cynic, then why are they trying to why are they defying the set social system and, and comforted by the sympathetic, by the sympathy of those with control over that system? Last example. Someone is attending a local festival in their hometown with a longtime friend of theirs for some form of stress relief from the two's heavily demanding post-secondary academic schedules as end of semester, last of the year, culminating assignments, due dates, are rapidly approaching. They themselves have been cramming extensively over the last two and a half months to both get the projects done as soon as possible and produce a quality final pro to produce quality final products for their different course professors, whereas their companion is disregarding the given projects entirely for their courses, having been keeping absent for majority of classes, mostly, and only bothering to stay awake for half of a couple of the translated lectures that in some way pique their interest. Whilst partaking in the festival attractions, they asked their friend why they even decided to go to post-secondary schooling if they weren't even going to actually try and study a subject of some kind, but instead just dismiss the work, the workload and dodge the class sessions. To which said friend replies that the sole reason for them enrolling at the institution was because of their incredibly authoritative and verbally abusive parents who coerced them into going to further academia after high school by threatening their privilege of staying in their house, in their family house, if not. They're, ve they're very frightened by the prospect of becoming homeless, as, as they know, at least they think they know. People will, by nature, be viciously cruel towards them because of preconceived classist prejudice from the fact that they financially don't earn near enough at the job occupation they have to afford so much as a studio apartment, and ableist prejudice from the fact that they primarily communicate through sign language, something their parents neglect to consider nor often use in their household, predominantly relying on their underdeveloped lip-reading skills. The person then asks their friend more about their philosophical standpoints on life, to which they mainly identify themselves as an apolitical misanthropist, despite being rather extroverted personality-wise, holding heavy beliefs of absurdist nihilism and pessimism, gravitating towards a lifestyle centered around morals of epicureanism. Then often tend, they often tend to anticipate the worst potential outcomes from social interactions and try to appease others when possible to not risk getting on their unfavorable sides. Feeling overall that humans are malevolently 
malevolently egocentric animals with no way of beneficial functionality amongst one another, many times feeling as though they downright have a burning hatred towards people as a whole, especially those similar to their parents. They keep on the topic in conversation, they keep the topic in conversation with their friend throughout the day as both of them go on and off rides and engage in various activities. All the while, their friend genuinely is having fun and expressing a lot of affection and joyfulness towards them for the invitation to come along. Saying things such as, they don't know where they'd be in life without their support, or they're glad to have them, they're glad to have them just to listen to their stresses, even if they themselves don't understand or that they're a fantastic person to be around. Later in the evening, the two encounter a group of a group of peers who are coincidentally students of the same institution and begin coercing in conversing with them with a person with the person translating for their friend they all are highly excitable towards each other and the misanthropic friend even starts being just as emotionally vulnerable as they were towards their companion that invited them talking about the two's ongoing discussion of philosophy and their dysfunctional family dynamic as well as actually appreciating the other's input, other's inputs for their belief systems and, particip and perceptions of humanity. And by the closing time of the festival, everybody exchanges contact information with one another and makes vows to hang out on campus before the semester is done, plus during the summer vacation. Before parting ways for the day, the person who invited the friend tells them that if they were ever to be without housing and or finances in the near future, they can live in their apartment together f free of rent fees. And if they're ever in any physical danger from their parental figures to call them immediately and they'll rush over to help and however, to help however possible. Their friend is ecstatic to hear this offer. And despite the first and, and and departs, and they depart for the first time in years, truly feeling as though they have somebody in their life who they can rely upon. And once more, to continue the in sorry for my wording. And once more, I count the entire the entirety of the pessimistic misanthropist social behavior on this particular day as evidence for them actually being subconsciously optimistic by the very fact that they're consciously displaying consciously displaying authentic authentic emotional reactions of happiness slash joyfulness, excitement, enthusiasm, and pleasure from their engagements with the friend who invited them to attend the festival together, being very expressive and honest about their philosophical viewpoints, plus that of confidence in their friend in relation to their overly traditionalist, totalitarian, and mentally abusive parents. Even though according to the belief system they affiliate with and from their own telling they're and from their own telling, they're under the impression that the human race by its by its biological nature is completely psychologically malicious and sociopathic and in and incapable of individualist and or collectivist coexistence to a functionally per prosperous degree, whether within the confines of societal govern governance or through anarchy because of a lack because of lacking the capacity for greater understanding outside of our own self self perspectives along with the notion for them actively choosing to converse with the group of other students as well as taking a liking to their personalities and behavioral traits plus feeling bona fide enjoyment from said conversation despite them openly admitting that on occasions they cognitively have an intense outright spite for all of humankind, which is even more ontologically baffling considering they themselves, personality-wise, have developed more characteristics of extroversion over the course of their lifespan till this point. All in all, absolutely contrary to what the misanthropist claims to believe philosophically, as if they truly held massive as if they truly held massive contempt towards human beings in how, from their perception, our existence functions, then they would not try to participate in any type of socialization with people for non for non essential communal resources because it would be utterly futile and their personality slash persona most likely wouldn't have formed to be 
more projections to be more projections of in, of extroverted social sociability even in their early ch even if in early childhood they were initially so because if they had gone through a traumatization process it's highly likely it would have resulted in them gaining characteristics of introversion or more antisocial tendencies or schizoid tendencies as they grew older. In modern psychology, this is often referred to as wounded extroversion. To put it simply, if you look at the, misanth the misanthropic friends end of the inter interactions, specifically the fact that they're bothering to join in on talks with others about how much they hate humans and everything they do as a species socially because we're all deep down only in it for a harmful and empathyless self-gain and we'll most often use whatever methods we can to achieve to achieve what we want to any cost which therefore means we can never be truly helpful we can never be truly we can never do truly helpful things towards things together or by ourselves and that they themselves are more of a people person then it comes to then it comes to social when it comes to social gathering at events and attempting to get involved in some form of group activities it should be clear that their actions go against everything they're claiming to believe because by their logic by their logic human beings aren't able to induce any anything other than destructive problems and solely do stuff out of initial initial effort to cause each other pain and they also say and they also say they at many points in time feel an extremely strong despise for all members of the human race yet they're still choosing to try and interject themselves into conversations and share their opinions with individual people or a group in or a group in hopes that they'll understand their thoughts and views even with the supposed dislike towards the very creatures they're speaking what they're speaking to and in doing so in regards to those who disagree with them still will try presenting said views as if the minds of those they're talking to can change despite their pessimistic values so the conscious misanth so if the conscious misanthropist was actually a subconscious misanthropist then why are they participating in conversations as though something beneficial can come out of it and join said talking with others Bef now to address something before counter before the counter argument of before the counter argument of perhaps they've accepted humanity is by nature problematic and believe that our species should be that way malicious overtly sociopathic and psychopathic and hedonistic is presented to this example i can debunk that by asking them why do they at points feel a sensation of pure hatred for humanity if they truly believe that people are this can only be this and ought to behave like this then they would not feel this sense of anger and on another psychological basis why do the social pessimists leftist cynic and pessimistic misanthropist engage in discourse about their philosophies and ideologies with people who inquire into them or question the validity of their ideals whether their beliefs are ultimately scientifically correct or not because subconsciously it gives them a sense of meaning to their lives as debating or discussing these topics is something for them to pursue and be invested in at the present moment it gives them a sense of control over their lives as using their personal values to try and dismantle slash prove someone else wrong or convince them of said values is an attempt to protect what they believe protect what they believe through self-actualization it gives them a sense of understanding to their lives as using these philosophical concepts helps them orient their identities and moral actions in a way that seemingly best suits human nature it gives them a sense of uniqueness to their lives as they're presenting their own personal values and opinions they've generated from they've generated from them to someone else and it gives them a sense of familiarity to their lives as they become accustomed to these conceptual ideals of humanity over long periods of time this culminates in a subconscious sense of willingness for each of them then leading to a conscious response and motivation motivation causing them to initiate and or interact with the engagements in the first place to reaffirm these desires and if the desires aren't being fulfilled to their expectations this will lead to a conscious response of apathy 
As far as I've observed, the only alternative explanation for an individual making these philosophical and moralistic proclamations, then proceeding to take part in contradictory acts to their perceived belief systems, such as the ones described, to put it to put it bluntly, is if they're a narcissist who purely talks to gratify their own self, their own sense of perfect intellect in an attempt to seem profound and is infatuated with the sound of their own voice, a histrionic who purely talks to satisfy and impress the opinions of other individuals within their immediate or external social environments, so to perpetuate a wanted appearance of themselves, or an attention seeker who purely talks to gain excessive amounts of investment from other individuals in the prospect of being seen as having praiseworthy qualities and a dawning admiration. I draw influence for this hypothesis from Dr. Martin Seligman, an American clinical psychologist, and his theory of learned helplessness, learned optimism, and the three components of happiness in positive psychology. The previously mentioned Gottfried Wilhelm Lib Leibniz, Arthur Schopenhauer, and Diogenes, Philip Melander, a German philosopher slash poet, and his contributions to the philosophy of pessimism, Albert Camus, a French philosopher, such philosophical analyst and writer, and his philosophy of absurdism and contributions to the philosophies of optimistic nihilism and existential nihilism, Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philosopher, poet, composer, sociologist, philo philologist, genealogist, and his philosophical belief of, of affirming the unconditional embrace of life, often referred to as Nietzsche's cure for nihilism, Charles Bukowski, an American novelist, poet, and socioanalyst, and his contributions to the philosophy of misanthropy and his literary writings. Felix Skura, an American YouTuber slash commentator, and his contributions to the philosophies of egoism and optimistic nihilism and his theory of human beings innately having unconscious biases geared towards their own idealistic livelihoods. Dr. Alok Kanogia, an American psychiatrist, YouTuber, and streamer. If you know him, he's he runs the YouTube channel Healthy Gamer GG and his varying interviews with members of the online community and research into social isolation slash alienation and his own and my own personal social observations. To reiterate, a large quantity of people in the world who are philosophically self-proclaimed pessimists, cynics, and misanthropists that consciously identify with the corresponding principles of such beliefs are in actuality subconsciously optimistic in their perceptions and assumptions of the nature of humankind and ontology as a whole which can most often be attributed to an initially hopeful and positive outlook on different individuals and personal and societal surroundings during early adolescence, typically mid to late childhood, and a transition in, cogn in cognitive thought process from exposure to opposing viewpoints slash scientific information, usually occurring in the later stages of adolescence, typically early to mid teenhood. I will briefly state that I do indeed believe reverse scenarios of this philopsychological phenomenon are entirely possible too, such as someone consciously identifying as an optimist, but subconsciously being pessimistic, cynical, or misanthropic. However, from my current findings are far less common percentile-wise compared to the former, though I do not intend that as an excuse to invalidate or to invalidate the reversal experiences. I will end this submission with a quote from George Carlin, an American comedian, actor, writer, who, and writer, who during his later life associated himself more so with a philosophy of cynicism. However, I personally believe he was absolutely the very definition of a subconscious optimist. And no, I'm not going to do a George Carlin impression for this reading. This interview, you can find it by, uh, well, it was actually his last interview. You can find it on YouTube by searching up the quote. Um, if you scratch a cynic, you'll um, find an idealist. I gave up on this stuff. I gave up on my species. I gave up on my fellow Americans. I gave up on my countrymen because I think they all, I, I think we squandered great gifts. I think humans were given great, great gifts. Walking upright, binocular vision, opposable thumbs, large brain, making tools, making tools, large brain, large brain, make better tools, talk, have to learn language. You, you take this put here, you learn language, the brain got bigger. We grew, we had great gifts and we gave it up for both man, for both money and God, for God and man and both. We gave it up to the high priests. It was, it's our job of it's God's will. That's what they say, what people say. It's God's will because God can do whatever he wants. So, sorry, 
it's your job, it's God's will. That's what they say. That's what people say. It's God's will because God can do whatever he wants. So why pray? Why s they say pray for something? Okay, well, he didn't answer my prayers. Well, it's God's will. Well, if it's God's will, then why do I even pray in the first place? He's just going to do what he wants anyway. We gave it all up to superstitious, to superstition, primitive superstition, primitive shit, primitive shit, invisible man in the sky looking down, keeping track of what we do, making sure we don't do the wrong thing. If we do, he puts us in hell where we burn forever. That kind of shit is very limiting. It's very limiting for this brain we have. So we keep ourselves limited. And then we want a toy and a gizmo and gold and we want shiny things and we want something to plug in that'll make big, 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 big things for us. And all that shit is nothing. It's nothing. We gave it all up. And Americans, who also had great gifts, when, when you take the theory of democratic rule, self-government, okay, they started off wrong. They owned slaves. They didn't let women vote. They didn't let people who didn't own land vote. Fine. They got off on the wrong foot, but the ideas were good. Well, we fucking blew that and polluted it. We polluted it with this stuff, things, material goods, games, gizmos, toys, gadgets, having possessions. Oh, he's got a bigger truck. Okay, you see his truck? It's bigger than mine. I'm getting a new truck. Here's a big truck. Oh, I'm getting that one. Guess what? You Oh, guess what? You got a video and DVD too? Here, I have DVD. I got a TV, you know? Whatever happened... Whatever happened, all that, whatever happened, all that's what happened. And that's why I'm divorced from it now. I see it from a distance. I gave myself a divorce. I said, George, emotionally, you have no stake in this. You don't care one way or another, so wash it. Have fun with it. Have fun. You know what I say is this. When you're born in this world, you're given a ticket to the freak show. And when you're born in America, you're given a front row seat. And some of us get to sit there, get some of us get to sit there with notebooks. And I'm a notebooker. Oh, oh God, did you see that? Did you see what he did? Oh, and I watch the freak show and I keep notes and I make up stuff about it. And I watch the freaks. Freaks are all human and they're all like me and they're all the same. We're all the same. I'm not better. I'm not different. I'm just a part now. I'm separate. I'm over here because I put myself out of the mix. I don't have a stake in the outcome. I'm not a cheerleader for a given outcome now. Oh, they say if you scratch a cynic, you'll find a disappointed... Say if you scratch a cynic, you'll find a disappointed idealist. And I would admit that somewhere under all of this... All of this is a flicker, a flame of idealism that would love to see it all change. But it can't. It can't do... It can't happen that way. An incremental change, it just seems like the pile of shit is too high. All said whilst talking to, and that was end of quote, all said whilst talking to an interviewer and a camera to be distributed for an audience to watch and listen to. As of current, I wholeheartedly believe this theory. Connective sexual empathy, psychosexology. Note, this proposed hypothesis is not an excuse for invalidation or degradation of individuals who engage in sexual promiscuity, platonic sexual intimacy, non-monogamy, polyamory, polygamy, or sex work-related professions on the basis alone, on that basis alone. Currently, as far as I'm concerned, there is heavy tangible evidence that these social relationships have greatly beneficial properties slash effects to them and are absolutely not inherently problematic or in and of themselves based upon what I would consider to be provably unethical philosophic slash ideological principles such as patriarchal consumerism, commercialism, liberalism, neoliberalism, neoliberal fascism, libertarian capitalism, anarcho-capitalism, objectivism, and sexual hedonism, which are traditionally associated and stereotyped with the aforementioned lifestyles and sadly are predominant within industries affiliated to them. I consider these ideals to be artificial interactions amongst these relationships. I submit the following conclusion, that a moderate portion of the human population who engage in sexual promiscuity, engage in sexually promiscuous affairs and sexual relations in regards to monogamous, non-monogamous, polyamorous, or polygamous relationships, use said intimacy as a means of expressing slash projecting empathetic emotional affection, between themselves and other individuals, predominantly through actions of intercourse, oral sex, fellatio and cunnilingus, digital penetration, strip cheats, 
strip tease, foreplay, roleplay, pornographic content creation slash consumption, prostitution service slash consumption, erotic dance service, stripping slash consumption, group coitus section sessions, threesome, foursome, orgy, and group masturbation section sessions, accompanied by that of cognitive centralistic investment in the parties involved with the engagements. In essence, individuals that experience this psychosexological phenomenon consciously and or subconsciously attempt to convey empathy for others for other people through emotionally stimulating connectivity by means of sexual arousal and gratification utilizing their physiologic extremities such as genitalia limbs hands arms legs and feet uh, lips tongue chest slash breasts feminine masculine or alternate or alternate in in very close contact positions with their physically intimate partners along with passionate releasing as slash projectile of ejaculatory fluids masculine associated sperm slash semen tum and feminine associated transurethral discharge squirt typically concealing said behaviors from contemporary mainstream society out of what seems to what seems to did i type that wrong so i do what seems to be nope a consciously present fear of communal ridicule which is mo which in most instances from my perspective can be attributed to an unconscious to an unconsciously present fear of dying alone and or fear of abandonment and only actively displaying sentiments and or sentiments or feelings of empathetic empathetically charged eroticism within sexually accepting environments whether they're overall physically safer or psychologically and morally more beneficial or more detrimental from what I've observed, this desire to share and affirm humanistic understanding for, for other people through means of sexual intimacy typically develops due to typically develops with an individual due, due to one of three situations. The first the first being because of either extensively harsh or and repeated extensively harsh and repeated physical slash verbal sexual abuse from interpersonal figures or sexual suppression from surrounding intimate or external factors. The second being because of either a gained heightened insight to the predominant sociological depravity of the current state of the world we inhabit and contribute to and contribute to keeping an operational disarray, knowingly or unknowingly, or heightened insight to the many potential damaging effects of our intrinsic internal loneliness and confusing contrary ontology and the third because of either heavy because of either heavy emotional exposure to displays of social empathy and affection and affection and care throughout much of their adolescence or heavy emotional ex heavy environmental exposure to individuals who actually display and engage in connective sexual empathy sadly the first two scenarios that i described are more likely to be the causality of its integration into their psychosexual properties, at least as far as I've observed. The manifestations of how the sexual empathy is present within an individual on an autonomic, on, on an autonomic nervous level in terms of physiological arousal is, from what I can tell, quite varied, and I don't currently have any general idea of environmental stimuli that could be deemed as common triggers that's where that typing ends but so for that one for connective sexual empathy as i mentioned it's very it's varied across the board as to in terms of your physical like neuromuscular arousal whether in masculine genitalia in terms of say erection or just uh sexual cognitive stimulation or feminine erection, um, lift up of the labia and cognitive, again, sexual arousal. It's, uh, well, no, sorry, sorry, my mistake. Didn't mean to say cognitive. Neurological, in terms of the neurological process of the entire physiology, including your cerebrum, brain structure, and limbic system for projection of sexual arousal to the striatum. It's uh, in terms of what the external stimuli that triggers that response. I can't say what is common, what's a common, common trigger in everyday life for 
most people from what I've observed by this point, I'd have to do further research into that because right now it's, it's really just completely varied in terms of the physiological arousal process, but in terms of the psychological arousal process that triggers the physiological response in the nervous system, I'd say the most common, by this way, I want to get it typed down. The most common would probably be, well, here, let me think about it real quick. Okay, so the most, probably the two most common external triggers, I would say, overall, is, I, I'm putting them at the exact same, like, percentile rate as of right now. One may be higher than the other, but not entirely sure at this moment, is external social triggers that are involved with someone being treated very poorly or unempathetically, having being given lack of compassion or lack of sympathy, or being someone picking up on a person who maybe they are very close to, or just another person that they see out in a certain environmental setting they see is being very misunderstood and or in more specifically in that regard in a sexual manner in a sexual setting is very misunderstood maybe to sexual orientation sexuality or even gender expression or their physiological gender or uh, just in a or desired fetish uh, what one's fetishes may be sexually desire any in that main ballpark or in commonly in regards to affection that is displayed amongst people and amongst or again in a sexual setting displayed amongst someone as a whole uh, as a displayed to a group of people or some amount of compassion and empathy that is displayed towards person who is being very sexually um, active or sexually expressive in some way and it's that sexual connectivity between our social interactions that's basically as far as I'm concerned well that would be just the sexual connectivity overall emotionally on an emotional level and through sensualistic properties indulging in the actual sensation itself of emotional investment is what is the problem is the most common trigger psychologically for this psychosexological phenomenon to occur and it's at a moderate rate overall i would say worldwide not like a complete large extent for not just for just the general populace and also for those who engage in sex work, sexually promiscuous um, interactions or in um, non-monogamous or polyamorous relationships and polygamy as well in terms of marriage in that sort of fashion. So basically it's a moderate rate. It's not to, I don't think it's largest extent but it's a moderate rate and as far as I'm concerned in terms of treatment for from what I've observed treatment for this phenomenon I believe because I don't believe this this isn't a disrupt this phenomenon in and of itself is not a dis, disorder or disrupt to the psychological state it's a gained sexual desire and well many parts of sexual attraction it's a want to obtain empathy, which this, as well as I should state that this um, phenomenon can result in a variety of psychiatric disorders, attention-seeking personality disorder, uh, egotistical personality disorder, depressive, internalized or not, depressive disorders, dissociative disorders, uh, anxiety disorders, paranoia disorders, uh, infatuation disorder, some kind, uh, domineering behavioral disorder, thrill-seeking behavioral disorder, uh, dependent personality disorder, uh, borderline personality disorder, 
as well. Uh, could also as well narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, and these are just what I'm from what I've observed and I'm thinking of right now would be the most common associated with it. Uh, nymphomania, absolutely hypersexuality. It can induce sex addiction. This um, phenomenon is what it can induce. Um, and uh, also could induce a variety of other habitual addictions, maybe alcoholism, drug, substance use, um, entertainment, complete entertainment escapism. Um, uh, well, uh, what else? Potentially a financial addiction of some kind, too, as well. Um, and, well, okay, that's, that's the gist of, well, I believe those are the predominant disorders that can form as a result of this, uh, well, phenomenon. And as for treatment, from what I've observed, I do believe that pornography and prostitution work and strip dancing or telephone sex and telephone sexual narration, erotica writing and journaling or even erotic illustrations of pornographic drawing depictions uh, in that regard just the general basis of most of just the the concepts of sex work can actually be utilized as an effective treatment for people who are going through experiencing this psychosexologic phenomenon and it can be utilized in a non-detrimental way I feel from what I've observed to some nth degree to actually well to actually mitigate discomfort brought on by this phenomenon for me personally, I know that I absolutely experienced this psychosexological phenomenon. I experienced sexual connective empathy. As far as I'm concerned, that's why I decided to go into pornography and just, well, sex work and why I talk passionately about it. And, well, yes, that's well what I can say for that. So I do believe that it can be utilized as an effective means of treatment, but uh, okay. Now moving on from that. I think this will be the last one for... Oh, my phone's dying. This will be the last one for this section, and then I will charge my phone and then continue on with these. Okay. Globalized social paranoia. Psychosociology. I submit the following conclusion that as of this current point in humanity's history, a mass effect paranoia disorder has become widespread across a majority of the global populace, having become severely amplified within roughly the last seven decades, 1950s to 2020s, estimated off of observed shifts in cultural attitudes, political ideologies, and implemented government policies from various psychosociological studies and recorded phenomena throughout different countries. However, as far as my research findings suggest, the onset of its higher prevalence can be traced back much further to around the turn of the 16th century, 1560s to... No, I can't read that right. 1560s to 1580s. Gradually rising in public volume since then, and overall becoming more readily apparent to psychoanalytical, psychoanalytical monitoring. More specifically in relation to human socialization and inclinations to trustworthiness amongst one another in our species. Along with being heavily imperative in the development of a variety of psychiatric illnesses, predominantly psychotic disorders, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorders, schizoactive disorder, anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, depressive disorders, dissociative disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD and PRO, egotistical personality disorder, Egotistic personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, sociopathy slash psychopathy, narcissistic, Machiavellian, independent, dependent, catatonic, schizoid, schizotypical, atypical, 
avoidant, obsessive personality disorder, attend ADHD, dismissive behavioral, aggressive behavioral disorder, domineering behavioral, kleptomania, bipolar disorder, and bipolar aggression. This phenomenon, I feel, is also to blame for development of the currently classified rare mental disorders of folie du, which translates to the madness of two from French, Alice in Wonderland syndrome, Capra syndrome, and reduplicative amnesia. Development of mental conditions that are not in and of themselves disorders, such as schizophrenia, body dysmorphia, and intellectual complex, most often in association with narcissism, superiority complex, most often associated with egotism, narcissism, and sociopathy, and sociopathic characteristics, and megalomania, a grandiose complex slash god complex, most often in association with psychosis, can be linked to this problem. I specifically Come on. Uh, I specifically make the distinction of this psychosociologic pandemic itself being an overtly mass hysteric paranoia rather than a mass hysteric psychosis, as I believe it is very much as I believe it is very much so an integrated pathological fear of pro socialization amongst the broader hu human population within different individuals, given physical given physical and metaphysical environmental surroundings, though is not to dissuade, is not to dissuade the very much truthful fact, at least as far as I'm concerned, that of there being an extremely present mass psychotic disorder that has prevailed throughout the current world, which I feel is directly attributed to the equally as overarching social paranoic mentality. From what I've observed, this deeply rooted disruption to natural pro-social human instinct that is apparent in almost every facet of daily life within numerous modern societies and has been so and has been so predominantly for the last five centuries now is concretely related is concretely related to the various initial and continued upholdings of different forms of societal authoritarianism and manufactured resource insecurities instigated by corporate profiteers by corporate profiteers. This can be seen through extensive amounts of socio-anthropological data collected in regards to the biggest in institutionalizations of political rhetorics in history, starting, and this is a long list, in history, starting with the brutal hierarchical, hierarchical feudalist class dynamic of most of Central and Eastern Europe in, er in the early to mid 1500s, which ideologically might have spread outward from relatively geographically isolated ancient Japan as the island nation heavily practiced feudalism, moving on to the mass, to the mass increase in societal control by imperialist monarchies of Western Europe, especially in regards to Anglo-Saxon, Franco, and Germanic racial superior supremacy around the early to mid 1500s as well. Then the gradual and aggressive expansion of European colonialization across the African, South American, and North American continents, mainly in North in regards to North America, mainly Southern North America, Central America, with mass infliction of ancient Black, Latino, and Hispanic cultural genocide in the mid to late 1500s. Then the European colonialization of the entirety of Southeastern Asia with mass infliction of ancient Indo-South Asian, Austronesian, and Han cultural genocide in the early 1600s, then the further expansion of colonialism into northern North America with mass inflictions of ancient Anishinaabe, Huron, Sioux, Navajo, Cree, and Inuit cultural genocide in the mid to late 1600s, then the, then the transitional period out of total, aristoc of total aristocratic monarchical world governance as sporadic revolts against empires began to occur, began to occur and into the rise of hierarchical pseudo-capitalism around the mid to late 1700s, then the, exas then the exacerbation and amplification of chattel enslavement and corporate plantation extortion in the early to mid 1800s, then the European expan expanded colonialization of the oceanic continent, of the oceanic continent with mass infliction of ancient indigenous Australian, Palawan, and Maori cultural gen genocide along with the varying implementations of racial segregation globally in the late 1800s, then the traditional period, then the transitional period out of global, then the tradition, then the transitional period out of global pseudo-capitalist 
federalism into the rise of global ultra-capitalist republicanism and the transcontinental destruction of World War I, along with the first major political enactments, in my opinion, of neocolonialism in the Middle East in the early 1900s, then the transitional period in most of Central and Southern Europe and Eastern Asia out of ultra-capitalist republicanism and autocratic, an autocratic monarchy into the rise of ultra-fascist totalitarianism, as well as the reemergence of pseudo-capitalism and aristocracy in Eurasia, in the Soviet Union, and the transcontinental destruction of World War II, along with mass genocides such as the Holocaust, the Holodomor, and the, and the Great Chinese Famine around the mid-1900s. Then, the, uh, then the outbreak of the First Cold War, with geopolitical propaganda implementations of the neoliberal fascist Red Scare and pseudo-capitalist anti-Americanism slash anti-Westernism, as well as incitements of varying global proxy wars by the American government and the Soviet Russian government, along with mass protests and uprising, uprisings worldwide against racial, class, sexual, and gender oppression globally in the mid to late 1900s. Then the Western European, American, Canadian, Mexican, Brazilian, and Australian governmentally backed insurgents and collapse of the Soviet Union as well as mass global expansion of ultra-capitalist totalitarianism, along with the neoliberal fascist war on drugs slash war on terror, plus the initial abolishment, I put that in quotations, abolishment of apartheid segregation in South Africa in the late 1900s, entering into this century. Then the rise of many Islamic extremists and Christian extremist groups in the wake of 9-11 and post 9-11, as well as the American, English, and Australian-led, and Canadian, Israeli, Turkish, Saudi Arabian, Spanish, Polish, New Zealandic, Polish, New Zealandic, and Tasmanian-backed militant invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan to set up puppet state governments for westernized corporate oil extraction, along with a resurgence of neoliberal movements globally in the early to mid 2000s, and finally landing at the modern era of the outbreak of the Second Cold War with persisting neo -fa neoliberal fascist totalitarianism and digitally adapted ultra-capitalism, as well as extensive neo-colonialist inst instrumentation and commercialism, commercialism accompanied by mass performative activism, along with alt-rightist and alt-leftist internet subcultures in the mid to late 2010s into the now early 2020s, quarter of the 21st century. My four other theories of the unempathic slash unsympathetic cycle of conflict, the lie of constantly needed technological advancements, the lie of sustainable survival related happiness under capitalism, and purposely stupefied systemic education for elitist authority are in congruence with this hypothesis. This social paranoia typically manifests within average people as what I can best describe as being a very casual and or passive aggressive passive aggressive suspiciousness in others' true intentions, not just in an individual's involvement with a particular situation, but also in an, individ in an individual's briefest, make an emphasis on briefest, briefest observations of a situation that has drawn their attention, plus that of some form of emotional disconnection towards those who are simply passerby to an individual in a communal setting and complete, and complete public dismissal of those behaviorally presenting themselves as being in some amount of distress. I make an emphasis on the concept of one's examinations being incredibly brief in relation to, given, to a given event or issue because it's exponentially apparent that, the subtle, fear, that the, the subtle fearfulness of other humans is projected out of mainly preconceived notions associated to things in similarity to what is or has been displayed to them over a period of time. Said things are perceived by the individual in question as potentially threatening to their physical self and or their philosophical way of life. I attribute most, de most developmental aspects of this irrational paranoia, paranoic neurosis to repeated childhood and teenhood exposure to hysterical slash radical political ideologies and moralistic values blatant or subtle, blatantly or subtly identified held by close interpersonal relationship members, immediate family, extended family, family friends, peer friends, acquaintances, co-workers, teachers, etc. Mass societal indoctrination from nationally, systemically, 
regulated edu regulated educational institutions, mega media and entertainment companies tailored for the purpose of creating covert propaganda, mass community policing, especially in regards to targeting demographic sub to targeted demographic subjugation and profiling, religi religious fanatical extremism, and adopt and adopted dependencies on overshadowing corporations for financial security and tolerance of cultural identity slash traditions. I can prove this theory by examining the daily routines that most of the average world populace follows in essence and the sole behaviors of a majority of people across the world, dis the world display whilst engaging with one another publicly, especially in the shortest possible interactions, as well as how even those who are in some form aware of this global psych psychosociologic pandemic very frequently are oblivious to their own hold on very frequently are oblivious to their own illogical and unreasonable suspicions towards others that is caused by said hysterical paranoia disorder i would i would think as of current it is fair to say that people largely tend to and that's where it stopped but i'll explain the rest so i would say that people on a large, for the most part, tend to keep very wary of things such as financial information, uh, any personal information relating, say, to issues going on in a family setting, a, a medical information, medical and psychiatric um, documentation or records they keep very private, uh, uh, being very briefly, briefly open emotionally with people on an everyday basis publicly. And also, especially in this regard to those who are, who are aware of this in some form, but oblivious to it when it's actually put into practice, having some amount of suspicion to actually allowing someone like a certain, um, certain leeways into your life or like certain maybe resources that one may have. Like say if someone who knew about this phenomenon, this pandemic, as I believe it is, a psychological pandemic. It, say if someone was to ask for someone's email address and this person was a roommate of a college dorm buddy their their roommate and they had to fill out some information and they gave them that information but they had something that needed their email address for this person is then like oh whoa, 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 whoa. i mean no i think that's enough i'm not going to give you that i'm i mean i know you, i trust you well enough but i don't trust you that much i don't trust you as much with that as the other things so i'm going to stop there even though when asked, they don't really have any good explanation to it. They ask, okay, well, why do you not trust putting this into here for this information with your email address is fine. Here's proof that it's actually potentially most likely safe. And they say, eh, no, I just, well, I just don't really want to. I don't trust it that much in many regards. I don't think it's very, well, I think there's a, I still think there's a potentiality for it to go awry, even though there's given proof that it won't most likely. So even something like that, or like someone say, uh, if someone's going through a psychologically at the moment, very emo, a lot of immediate, like they're readily aware of emotional distress that they're going through consciously. And they're just having fun with say, or they're talking with say one of their coworkers or a friend of theirs or a family member of theirs. And they're being like very casual and very just chatty and sociable, but they talk about, like they briefly mention that they're not doing well mentally. They're not doing very well mentally at the moment. And the person, someone asks, what's wrong? You want to talk about it? And they're like, yeah, no, I don't really want to talk about it. And they're more like, oh, why? And they're just like, yeah, well, I just, it's too personal, I guess, right now. And that I think can be attributed to this globalized paranoia that, um, a mistrust in human nature as if they're not going to understand from repeated instances of people 
a large not actually understanding what they're trying to convey to some degree. And it's now it's as far as I'm concerned, it's more prevalent. Really got to charge my phone. It's more prevalent in in certain countries other more than others, but it's present in, I'd say, a majority of the countries of the world, majority of nations. And it's international. It spans cross-culturally, mass amounts of different demographics and people groups and traditions. It's heavily expansive. And, and even in the countries where it's less than, say, the ones where it's more predominant, it is still there in some facet to some degree. I would actually argue it's there in some degree, but just it's there because of the very fact that we have governmental, governmentally divided territorial borders. And the fact that um, we're not a globalized world, we have international borders drawn and policing systems in place to actually stop those from, well, ex external societies coming in without proper certification to some degree through visas or documentation, uh, letters of invitation, depending on the country, uh, things of the sort. So that I would consider a form of social paranoia. So yes, I, oh, and as of current, I wholeheartedly believe that theory. And going back to connective sexual empathy, I wholeheartedly believe that. I don't believe I mentioned that. Wholeheartedly believe both of those. Okay, I'm just going to charge my phone quick and then continue on with this.